So, uh, welcome everybody to London Vegans. This is our July 2023 meeting. And I'm pleased to say we've got some guest speakers from the Vegan Society here today. A uh, question that often gets asked is, you know, what does the Vegan Society do? Because there are a vast number of vegans in this country, but only a small number are members of the society, which hopefully we're going to increase the, in numbers. Um, and from the Vegan Society, uh, we have Gemma Williams, Sam Calvert and Stephen Sanders. So I'm going to hand over to Sam, who's going to give a presentation and after which there'll, that will be some questions and answers. So without further ado, may I hand over to Sam Calvert. Thank you for coming and speaking to us, Sam. Thank you. Bear with me while I move to a presentation. Um, the slideshow yeah i'm just trying to it's in the middle there we go is that okay for you yeah yeah excellent um okay so um so hello and thank you for your time this evening and for the opportunity to talk to you about the Vegan Society and to answer any questions you might have. My name is Sam Calvert. I'm Head of Communications and Fundraising at the Vegan Society. I'm a member of the Senior Leadership Team at the Society and the Communications Team is involved in all aspects of internal and external communications, both digital and traditional. Um, the team also comprises our Supporter Services Team, which includes membership, and all aspects of fundraising. I'm joined this evening by my colleagues, Stephen Sanders, our support, Senior Supporter Services Officer, and Gemma Williams, our Supporter Services and Digital Content Assistant. This short presentation looks at what the Society achieved in 2022. To give you an idea of the remit of the Society, um, one of the key things I would hope to clarify this evening is the breadth of the work of the Society. Um, I feel this is an important point of difference between the society and other campaign groups and charities working in the area of veganism. We actively look not to replicate the good work being done by other charities and campaigning groups, um, but rather to support them in doing that work and to look at where the gaps are and how we can best fill those. For example, if you contact any other vegan organisation about support for a vegan in prison, they will direct you back to the vegan society most likely. If you are looking for support and guidance on an issue of vegan rights, you will also probably end up directed back to the Vegan Society. We fund the necessary work that is often not as glamorous or high profile as that of other groups, but the work that supports people to go and stay vegan. So the Vegan Society is, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with our work, is the um, oldest vegan charity established in 1944, nearly 80 years ago. Um, we celebrate our 80th anniversary next year, in fact, in November. Um, one of our, our founders include um, Donald Watson and Elsie Shrigley. And um, it was our founders that introduced the word vegan and defined that meaning as a philosophy and way of living that seeks to exclude, as far as is possible and practicable, all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing or any other purpose. Raising the profile of veganism has always been a key focus of the Vegan Society, and that remains true today. But as was asked on the London Vegans Facebook page not that long ago, what does the Vegan Society actually do? And I hope this evening to explain a little more about our work and how it supports the vegan movement. In nutrition, we have an in-house in -house dietitian, Andrea. In 2022, our nutrition team, which comprised Andrea and Chantal, who you might have seen on, on videos, um, they responded to 445 emails, phone calls and letters in relation to queries from members and supporters, um, the public, caterers, health and nutritional professionals and, and prisoners. Um, they wrote 18 articles um, for online and print magazines, 
blogs and newspapers, including for the vegan, vegan food and living and the Daily Mail healthy uh, living guide. And they delivered 19 outreach sessions, including practical kitchen training for university students, talks to the general public at vegan festivals and events and presentations at primary at the primary care and public health conference. We also secured the use of our vegan eat well guide, which is a version of the um, NHS eat well guide on the pub on public health Wales website. In our campaigns team, the vegan society works hard to promote the benefits of veganism to different audiences throughout our campaigns. In 2022, our Plate Up for the Planet campaign, which spreads the message that a vegan lifestyle is the best choice for environmentalists, achieved a reach of 10 million, with 2,500 people downloading the ebook filled with delicious recipes and tips on how to start a vegan journey. Our campaign, Live Vegan for Less, um, to help people to live vegan on a budget include, continued in 2022 with new cost comparison research, recipes and blogs. We secured 14 pieces of media coverage, including pieces in the Daily Mail. Our campaign focused campaign, our, our animal focused campaign, which ran throughout World Vegan Month in November, shone a light on the animals at the heart of our message. We released the results of a new study about the public's attitudes towards non-human animals, which found that 90% of Britons agree that farmed animals experience the same emotions as cats and dogs. In our advocacy and education work, our rights team handled 377 inquiries in 2022 from people who needed support to assert their rights as a vegan. In one example, our vegan rights advocate, Dr. Jeanette Rowley, supported a person through a very stressful issue with their workplace, not accommodating their vegan beliefs. Our legal work included conducting a comprehensive review of how the human rights reforms impact on the legal protection of veganism and vegans, and providing expert guidance to an NHS health trust focus group regarding the protection of vegans and medicine labelling. In 2021, we hired a dedicated education officer, Laura Chetner. Laura also chairs the Vegan Society's Education Network, which aims to promote vegan inclusive education by supporting educators and learners with information and resources and lobbying on behalf of the latter where necessary. Whilst every individual can make a difference, we'll never reach a truly vegan world without systemic change. Our policy work calls for legislative change to support vegans and transition to veganism. Our policy team attended various events last year, including the Labour and Conservative Party conferences, the RSPCA Animal Matters campaign launch, and the School Food Fringe to meet with key stakeholders and ask important questions. The policy team responded to 18 government consultations. The aim of these consultations is to allow the government to make informed decisions on changes to policy. Our consultation and policy work helps to prevent strict labelling enforcements for dairy related terminology. It is important to us that our work is underpinned by a sound evidence base. In 2022, our research team held a conference at Manchester University where 10 speakers gave a variety of talks on a range of vegan related research topics. They launched a, our research webinar on The Pulse, which invites academics to present on a range of vegan related research topics. Anyone can join in these, um, these research uh, webinars uh, that we advertise them on our social media and any member of the public is welcome to join those. Um, we published 26 research news articles on our website and um, we collaborated with 41 UK universities. We support various forms of grassroots outreach. Uh, we hired a dedicated community network coordinator in 2021, who now supports 14 community organizers and 306 community advocates who are campaigning on our behalf in their local areas. We also provide leaflets free of charge to anyone who requests them for their own outreach projects. We awarded a total of £25,371 through 22 grants to outreach projects around the world, 
These projects included new audiences to go vegan, um, encouraged audiences to go vegan, and included radio shows, cooking courses, festivals, school talks, workshops, and more. 16 grants went to projects in economically developing countries. Six went to projects based in the UK and Serbia and um, Turkey. And in the media in 2022, our press releases and comments featured 229 times across 150 different media outlets. We appeared on various broadcast programmes, including the Jeremy Vine Show and BBC Radio 4's PM. We relaunched our podcast, The Vegan Pod, releasing a monthly episode throughout the year and secured over 6,000 downloads. We launched the Vegan Society um, account on TikTok. And Facebook, uh, we, saw engage we saw engagement increase by 36%. Facebook total video views reached 287,324, an increase of 64%. And on Instagram, total video views reached 183,676, up by 126%. So um, we're a charity. Um, we rely heavily on membership, um, donations and legacies to continue to fund the work we're doing to make veganism more mainstream and to help people to go and stay vegan. Um, you can help us by becoming a member from just two pounds a month and receive a number of benefits in return, our quarterly magazine, exclusive content on the online members area, direct access to our dietitian and over a hundred discounts, including Holland and Barrett, The Body Shop and our multivitamin Veg One. You can make one-off or regular donations um, or leave a will to the leave a gift in your will to the vegan society. We've teamed up with an online will writing service, Fairwill, who make it really simple to write and update your will free of charge. Our community network um, is available for um, people to join and support um, campaigns in your local area. Um, or you could join a group of desk-based volunteers to help with tasks such as research and proofreading, and that can all be done remotely. And indeed, um, you can always come and work for us. We advertise all of our vacancies um, on our website. Um, so that's um, the end of my short presentation. As I say, my colleagues, um, Stephen and um, Gemma are here as well with me this evening. And we're really interested to hear um, your views on the society and to answer your questions. Um, and um, yeah, I open the floor over to other people. Thank you. Do you, do you want to stop sharing the slide if you want mine, please? Of course. Thank you. And uh, let's see if I can uh, highlight that spotlight for Stephen and Gemma. And okay. Um, yeah, th thank you for that uh, presentation. I just wondered if I, I know I said some people who are online with us today are all, already members of the society. So it'd be useful to know from them what extra or what else they would like from the society. And for those who aren't members, I, I don't think actually if we can do a, let me just see if I can do a gallery view just with a, I was going to say show of hands, but you can, there is a facility to lift up a hand even if you are not haven't got your screen on, but just to get an idea of how many people, um, who how many people who aren't mem are not members of the Vegan Society. If you're not a member, can you just put your hand up? Is there any who are not yet members? Not, yeah. So the I said some may not have a facility for lifting up the okay. Um, so you put the hand down. Just the, the the question then is why why haven't you joined? What is it that I don't know? Is it that other groups are providing that the vegan society isn't, or is it just that there's a lack of money to go around and you think that other ones have got more priority? I'd be interested to hear um, on that side of things as well. So would anybody like to, to, to comment on that? Anybody? Okay. So you can put your hand up again. Let me just see if you've got... Yeah, hi, John. Just uh, unmute. Are you a member of the Javican Society, John? I am, yeah, yeah. Uh, life member. Okay, good. Um, 
I know that um, Sam Calvert used to be a worker for the Vegetarian Society. So I could ask um, Sam why she thinks that more people don't move from the Vegetarian Society and join the Vegan Society. Well, well done for you for switching, by the way. <laughs> Um, I was actually a vegan when I worked at the Vegetarian Society back in the mid 90s. Um, so I, I was always a vegan during my time there. Um, and actually, I think that was quite useful. I worked in campaigns then and I was able to make sure that veganism was was represented um, at, at, within the um, within the Vegetarian Society. Um, but um, yeah, picking up on your point, I, I don't know actually what our overlap is between members of the Vegetarian Society and the Vegan Society. I think there probably is a, a reasonable overlap. And the reason I say that is um, I'm also responsible for fundraising and I see um, the legacies that we receive and we're always very grateful for those. Um, but often we're more, more often than not, we're left um, what's called residuary or, or legacies where you're left a percentage of the estate, which is very, very generous. And most of those people tend to leave it to a number of charities. So often the split is between maybe three or 10 or even 20 charities. And usually when we're noted, so is the Vegetarian Society. So I would say in a lot of the cases, probably um, may, maybe eight out of 10 of them, the Vegetarian Society would also be receiving a gift. A, a generous gift at that as well as the vegan society so certainly amongst older members my impression is that they were likely to be members of both the vegetarian and vegan societies um, I don't know whether that's true of our newer and younger members I don't know whether we've actually asked that question specifically in terms of no Stephen's shaking his head so I was just wondering we have done membership research in recent years whether we'd asked exactly what what other organizations people are members of but I suspect there probably is a still a, a fair overlap um, I don't I don't think it's necessarily the case that there is that there's an entrenched vegetarian membership that wouldn't dream of joining the vegan society. In fact, I, I, my feeling is that people who join organisations are joiners and often they're, they're, they're more likely if you're a member of one society, I'd say you're more likely to join another. Yeah. Um, I, I think the world is divided personally into joiners and people who say, you know what, I'm getting on OK as a vegan without joining. I, I managed to get the information I need from social media or from people influencers and um, there's lots of magazines out there and lots of um youtube videos and i don't really need to join so i, I think that's probably the real split for me just to add on to that i think uh, nowadays some people just prefer to to support groups rather than feel they need to be members um, and i know some organizations have moved away from the idea of having a membership uh, just having supporters um, but thanks for the question john uh, is it Nishmal Mahersh from Shambhu's? Hirsch, hi there. Hi, hi everyone. Um, um, yeah, um, so thanks very much for that presentation. Really, yeah, really interesting and informative. Um, and we are, um, just to let you know, we are longtime members of the Vegan Society and also longtime trademark holders. Um, so, so, yeah, really, really appreciate all, all that you do. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you about on one of your slides. You said that um, um, uh, you you funded um, organisations around the world, help you know help with grants organisations around the world. I think you said you you quoted about twenty five thousand over twenty five thousand um, <clears> pounds. <throat> so um, I, I just wanted to understand that a bit more because that figure just sounds um, like it needs to be a lot lot more um it, it just sounds very very little to be able to do do much it's great that that you are supporting a lot of grassroots organizations in so many different countries but but it strikes me it's not it can't it can't really go very far with that sort of money and um do you have other is that something that's being addressed because there is there are a lot there are other sources of the trademark um, routes the, the funds that um, are generated from the trademark um, and from other sources, I was just wondering how about, could they be channeled? Is there a demand for that, for for for, for such grants to to enable more more activism that that you support? Um, yeah, just wanted to, to hear more from you on that that front. That's okay. Thanks, Mahesh. Great question. Yeah, th thanks for that, and, and and thank you for your support of the society. Um, yeah, so um, I think we would probably all acknowledge that twenty five thousand pounds as a percentage of our turnover is is very small, and I know it is something that our trustees are aware of and are quite keen to um, to increase. Um, so I, I think there is an awareness of that. 
Um, the reality is that a, a lot of our um, income is, is very much tied up with the work that we went through this evening that, that we're doing. So the society currently employs um, getting on for um, 60 plus staff um, and we're involved in quite a wide range of activities. So we have a, a range of commitments that we, we already have to meet. Um, those the twenty five thousand pounds are given in grants directly to the people who apply for grants. So that's not work that we're directing or doing in that country. We're giving it to those grassroots organisers. So that might be a group in um, a group in an, an African country that want to run a series of radio programmes to educate people about veganism in their local area. Now, those would be people who are part of that community, not people going in and trying to change their lifestyle or diets. If they have to be very much embedded in that community. Um, but um, so it would be the, the money is given to them to do the work that they think will best achieve the objectives in their area. So we're not directing it in any way. And often, you know, that although the sum might be quite small, typically a grant might be a thousand pounds. But actually that can achieve a great deal in some countries, particularly in economically developing countries um, where the, the kind of money we're talking about has a far greater buying power than it would in the UK. Having said that, I would agree that if we had 10 times that figure or 100 times that figure, we would be able to find people to utilise those grants. There's no doubt that there is much more demand um, than there is money available. But it's also the case that although we receive a lot more demand, the quality of those applications isn't always there. So at the moment, we, we still are probably able to give money to everybody who produces an application that we feel is strong enough because wherever you're giving that money, however great the need is in the world, you want to make sure that the people you're giving it to are able to, to, to achieve a, a good return on that investment, that they, they know how to run a campaign, they know where to find um, people who might become vegan, that they have some, some basic understanding of, of how to make a difference. So in terms of quality applications, I think we managed to fund to some extent everyone that applies to us. But we could we could certainly I'm sure they could run bigger campaigns if we had more money to give them. Um, and I think that, you know, there is a, there is a potential there for improvement. There are a lot of other organisations also offering grants, although probably not on quite the same. Um, our, our grants tend to be about developing new audiences for veganism. Um, but there are a number of campaign groups around um, the world that do offer support in different ways. And we also direct people to that as well. Sometimes people seek match funding in a number of uh, from perhaps ourselves and other charities as well to try and achieve a, a bigger project. Does that answer the question, Ahesh? Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, and um, I'm just, just thinking also about the trademark um, because that I believe that's a really successful part of, of the work of the vegan society. So so I, I imagine there's, I know you, you have to have a lot of stuff to, to, to be able to run the trademark scheme as well. Um, but I imagine that's a good, I mean, is there a lot of funds generated from that that can be used to 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 boost the, the funds available for such grants? Is that is that something? Yeah, I mean, the bulk of our, our, our income does come from the trademark overwhelmingly. So I would say, um, the majority, the overwhelming majority of our income comes from trademark and other commercial activities like the sale of, of Veg One as well. Um, so income from what's known as voluntary income. So that's uh, defined as um, membership, donations, legacies, um, things which are given by individual donors um, is, is quite a small proportion of, of our income. Um, most of it we, we do earn through through trading activities or our limited company. Um, Having said that, if you look at our accounts, which again are publicly available on the Charity Commission's website, um, you, you can see that um, we we are using most of our income. You know, we are producing a surplus, um, but it's it's not huge. So, in in terms of the number of the sheer number of staff we have and the overheads that we have, um, I'm sure we could make some decisions to spend more on um, on grants, but um, that would be at the cost of something else. So I suppose if we spent more on grants, we would probably end up spending less on campaigns, for example, um, or some other area of work um, like um, communications or the, the trademark itself um, outside of staffing probably isn't that they're not spending huge amounts on marketing, for example. Arguably, they could perhaps spend could do with spending more money on the marketing if they had it. Um, it it's quite a labor intensive process. Um, the trademark we do do a very thorough job so we do check back through all the ingredients through all the um 
from all the raw ingredients that go into that as well. So we're checking back down the line. That's quite labour intensive. So it, the bulk, if you look again at our staffing, the bulk of our staff are actually employed in the trademark team, taking part in those processes in order to earn that money as well. So um, I think there's, there's, you're right that some improvement could be made, but I think it's, um, it, it would be at the, currently at the cost of something else, I think. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Going back to the you know, sort of why is it that there aren't more people who are members or supporters of the vegan society? And I think one aspect you may have just covered there is that people don't see, I mean, for the, for the vegan trademark, they may not see all the work that's involved in being able to certify a product as being vegan. And also that some of the projects that you're spending the money on, which you mentioned about doing the research papers and seminars and webinars, um, helping prisoners and things, it's not the sort of thing that tends to get into the media, like um, some other organisations which be doing some protests outside a supermarket or or, or, or veganuary, for example, which is very much in the news, you know, at, at different times of the year. Um, so what, what I was going to say, is there something that comes to mind within the vegan society uh, that you could think, well, you know what, let's try and get a higher profile, because if we have a higher profile, maybe people will want to be joining because they'll know more about us. Because I know we, as a, as a member, you know, and I've been, I've been also a, long, a member for many, many years, um, I'm happy to support you, and there's other members online here who are happy to support you, but it's about getting younger people coming on board as well. Yes, and I think that's I think that's a very important point you make, and and um, 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 I think it's it's absolutely key that we when we look at the profile of our membership, um, a typical member is in fact around um, forty four years of age, mm. um, so our, our membership is is not um, is not reflective of the vegan movement as a whole, which as you're probably aware it tends to be um, under thirty five or perhaps even under twenty five years of age. Yeah. Um, so it, it is something that we're we're very you know we're painfully aware of really. Um, I think in terms of profile, a lot of the work that we do is is the um, the you know the kind of um, valuable end. It's it's the respectable end of of of, um, of um, policy work and, and of working with um, other influencers, other stakeholders. But it tends not to be the as I said at the beginning, the glamorous and That's high it. profile end of things, um, which is difficult on several levels. Really, one of them I think in terms of um, donations from from voluntary income people tend to donate to the things which um, are perhaps more challenging or radical, um, which they see in the media rather than to the, the, the really valuable work that we're, we're doing all the year round. Um, we, do, we do run campaigns that are more high profile. So our animal campaign um, last year, we, you know, the, num the, the awareness level of that on social media, for example, was, was very high. We, we put, um, you know, we can't, we have a lot of work going into advertising for that. Um, and also, you know, getting people to sign up to get information packs. Mm. Um, we have a, a an app for going vegan, V-Guide. Um, that's probably, you know, that, that has a large number of um, people who've signed up to that. Um, it's probably been our most successful go vegan uh, tool, yeah. in fact. Um, but I think, yeah, it, it, there's no denying that it's, it's, um, it, the kind of work that we're doing often isn't the high profile glamorous end of the market um and that it, that is a challenge for us but somebody has to do this work somebody has to be involved in changing policy and in making sure that um that we're working to change you know the work that we do on, on legislation as well um the people who are you know we're very much involved in you know some interesting cases around the world at the moment on vegan rights so it's not just in the uk for example there's a there's um, a case in in Canada that where we've been offering support. So it, it on we're doing lots of day to day bread and butter work that that um, needs to be done. Thanks, Sam. And if anybody has any questions, if you don't want to ask them out loud, you can post them into the chat box, and uh, I'll read them out for you. And uh, yeah, please please do that. So we'll have a few more questions coming through. And I know John's got another question. I think he has. Well, he's put his hand down. Um, I don't know if, if Stephen and, and Jeremy, do you want to say a little bit about what you do within the society? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, sure. So, um, hi, I'm Stephen Sanders. I'm the Senior Supporter Services Coordinator. And then within Supporter Services, we look after membership, essentially. So we administer membership, try and promote membership. And then we also um, go to events to represent the vegan society. So, for example, we're at um, Vegan Camp Out this weekend. If anybody else is going, yeah. uh, please come and say hello. Um, if anybody joins um, at Camp Out, you'll get a goodie bag. And if you remember and come and say hello, we'll give you a goodie bag as well. So, uh, yeah, please drop by and say hi. Okay. Look forward to seeing you there. And Gemma? Um, yeah, so I work on membership, um, deal with a lot of like general inquiries and things like that. So in the first instance, if you email membership or if you call us, then you probably get through to me. Um, and also I look after um, the social media side of things as well um, when it comes to membership. So, um, yeah, getting contact content out um uh i've been working on some like video campaigns so anything to try and like boost our membership on social media as well um you might have seen i've been sharing some things as well articles uh, blogs in the london vegans group so yeah that's um that's me posting things like that um so yeah that's me thank you very much for that thank you um any questions i'll just see if there's anything on the uh, so let me just have a look on here. Um, I think there might be some questions in chat, actually. Yeah, so someone said, I wasn't aware of the Vegan Society had a membership program until today. It's interesting. Uh, David, um, long-term member, can the Vegan Society influence the vegan options in supermarkets? Uh, it says, much of the plant-based vegan sections are full of ultra-processed, unhealthy, fake meats, including vegan corn. Mostly disappointing for interested meat eaters. Sorry, uh, yeah, mostly disappointing for interested meat eaters and disgusting for long term vegans. <laughs> and some do, some don't. That's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, so much of this must surely, much of this must surely discourage would be vegans. What would be great are some health food, healthy convenience foods. And then there's mentioning like all plants, uh, clients, for example, offer more interesting options. I think it's interesting because. The, the, um, we have debates sometimes on you know on the London Vegans Facebook group, and you know people say, well, I'm I like eating vegan sausages, and people will say, but why would you want something that's ultra high highly processed? And somebody else says, why do you want something that looks like meat? Um, and there's a whole spread of opinions within. I don't quite know <laughs> if you want to comment on that, Sam. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it I think it is very much um if we can use the term can we use the term marmite, <laughs> but it yeah, is. Yeah. It's, Marmite issue, I think. Um, we certainly come across um, members, and we have emails from members and supporters who who share the view that you've just been been reading out there that they feel that you know what's now called what used to be called veganism and is now called a whole food plant based diet yeah. is the way forward. Yeah. Um, and I'm probably of a, of an era of um, vegan that would probably sympathise with that view. So um, I think certainly in terms of long term health, it's probably best that people follow a diet that's cooked from scratch that involves um, whole food plant-based as it's now called. Yeah. Um, that, that will have the best outcome, I think, in terms of um, research that's conducted so that vegans will continue to be seen as a, a, a healthy choice. Having said that, there's no denying that a lot of people do enjoy um, some of these highly processed foods. Our view is generally that if they're, if they're seen as a treat food, if there's something that you eat now and then, because you happen to like that particular thing, it's fine. If it's the bulk of your diet, if everything you eat is highly processed, then the chances are that you're eating a lot of salt, sugar, um, and other additives that long-term won't really be beneficial to your health. So we, we do encourage, you know, via our dietitians and through messages and, and um, you know, social media and our, our recipes, we encourage cooking from scratch um and uh, not following a highly processed diet particularly in our live vegan for less campaign we're keen to actually say that the cheapest option is to cook from scratch and to to make you know food eat, eat seasonally those kind of things we, we also have to accept that not everyone has the time for that either it's something of a privilege to have the time to shop um cook from scratch hmm. people are often very time poor and they actually want to put a pizza in the oven that's you know not 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 as healthy as one they might make themselves but they haven't got the time to to make a different choice so um it, it is about you know being being respectful of the the differences there are amongst vegans yeah 
and, and the supermarkets will only sell products that sell. So if they've got a choice of making some healthy vegan food or vegan food that's you know, um, ultra processed and more people are buying the ultra processed food, that's what they'll stock. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's really the supermarkets rather than determined by the vegan society. Uh, Martin, you've got a question if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, <clears throat> hello there, thanks for the presentation. Um, I just wondered, are there any particular campaigns that you're running in schools to try and, um, I suppose, capture or persuade or, or inform, um, you know, younger uh, school children or just, you know, people under the age of, you know, 18 or whatever, um, schools and colleges. Um, and then secondly, I just wonder also, do you have any, any numbers, you know, which sort of represent how many vegans there might be in the UK and, and how that, that has that there has been a trend or how that has changed over the last few years. I mean, we all expect that the number of vegans has been increasing, I certainly do, and at least, at the very least, the number of people who are eating less meat has increased, but I just wondered if you had any, any numbers around those, those things. Thanks. Well, thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, I, we, um, as I mentioned in the slide presentation, Laura Chetner was employed in 2021. Um, she has a background in what's called vegan inclusive education. So she previously ran um, a, a website and worked with a, a group of educators um, to try and encourage vegan inclusive education. She's a ex primary school teacher and a parent herself. Um, and she has written uh, probably the, the most well known text on the subject that's been that's been published, uh, looking at this area. Um, so it was something we're, we're quite strongly involved in now. Laura does go into schools and, and um, gives presentations. She's also very much involved in educating the educators themselves. So talking about how it's important because um, veganism is a protected characteristic, how it's important in education. And in fact, educators don't have a choice, but to acknowledge um, if you've got a vegan child in your classroom, then you have to be inclusive of that child, just as you would any other protected belief, for example, a religious belief. Um, so the kind of language that you use in a classroom, um, the activities that you have, um, making sure that you're sensitive to that, finding ways of, of making it clear that the child's choice is a perfectly um, acceptable one and one that should be respected. Um, it, she's producing a whole range of webinars on that subject for educators and working with the parties to do that. So that, that is a key part of our work now. Um, and it's something that we're making a lot of progress on. Um, she's also going to be at uh, Vegan Camp Out um, coming up now. She's well, she's actually at Vegan Camp Out right now, setting up the, the children's tent there. So she has a range of activities um, running at, at Vegan Camp Out as well as a teenager's area as well. So across the whole age range, really, primary, secondary, um, we're, we're very much um, active in that space now. Um, picking up on your other point, which was um, around the numbers, we're still looking, if we're talking about vegans, meaning the vegan society's definition of vegan, veganism, people who um, are at least dietary vegans all of the time, then um, you're looking at perhaps just over 1% of the population, maybe around 700,000 vegans. Um, it's still quite a small number. When you look at the, the explosion of food products um, in the supermarkets and so on, that's very much catering, I suppose, for... Um, a group of people that are plant-based or people who are choosing, making a preference that they choose to use plant-based milks, for example. Um, a lot of those companies, corn included, um, their market, they would say, is people who are reducing their consumption of meat products or people are looking to, in, to have more um, alternatives to dairy products. They're not targeting purely vegans. Um, and if they were, there wouldn't be the range available that there is, to be frank, that simply aren't enough of us following a vegan diet full time at the moment to, to justify the sheer volume of products on the market. And I think going back to the other question, I think that's part of the reason why so many of the products are meat alternatives, because um, the market is people who want a direct substitute for meat. Um, so manufacturers are producing, you know, the, the best chorizo ver version they can. Um, rather than a, a dish made out of lentils that perhaps a longer term vegan might have enjoyed. Okay. Thanks, Martin. 
Um, I've got a question, I think maybe from Sandra. It says, firstly, did you get an apology from Good Morning Britain when they allowed wrong information on plant milks to be broadcast to the nation? I don't know if they apologised on TV. Is that you? No, I, I think that was something we did raise. Um, we did raise with them, but I don't think we ever got that apology from them. Uh, second, how close are you to changing legislation which mandates meat on... Which, is the, sorry, is that... Trying to understand it. Is the legislation at the moment that mandates meat has to be on the school menu? Because it says, how cl close are you to changing that legislation? Um, I think the general policy is, is a, the, there's guidance around um, healthy eating, as I understand it. So I don't know that um, that meat has to be available every single day, but I think there has. To, I think at the moment you would have to have that option available. I think. Right. So I I, I think you could potentially. I, I think I'm right in saying run something like a meat free day perhaps but throughout the whole week i think yeah, i believe yeah. it would have to be offered um some schools um you know will make a, a, a vegan option available every day on the menu so that any child could choose that and that would be our preference that every child has the option and not that it's just provided to those children who've signed up as mm. oh i'm a vegan and i need a special diet yeah i'll come thank you for that i'll come back to the third question uh paul appleby uh, hi paul Hello. Um, yes, got rather quite a lot of questions uh, for some, um, but I won't uh, pinch the stage. In fact, I'm actually uh, writing one at the moment, so perhaps uh, you could uh, um, answer this. Uh, you may have seen a recent article. It's the front page in the Guardian uh, about a couple of weeks ago about um, basically trading standards found that one third of products that were advertised, uh, labeled either plant-based or vegan, actually contained dairy products and or eggs. Um, and in the article, it, uh, it, the, the mention that there is no legal definition of the word vegan, um, is the uh, society on the case on this? I know you have a rights director there um is this something that can be rectified so that uh you know anyone who uh manufactures make a product label it as vegan and it isn't you know can be uh taken to court or otherwise you know dealt with yeah i mean that that's an, an interesting article um we haven't been able to get to the we were we were involved with the report author so we we were consulted on that paper but um we haven't been able to get to the bottom of what that information is we have asked for some clarifications from them because it's not clear from the, if you go and look at the original report it's not clear there whether or not this was um a case of intentional um it, we, we think it's likely that it was it was cross-contamination rather than actual ingredients being added to these foods. I think the way it's been reported, many people will assume that this means that um, ingredients were being added that weren't vegan rather than cross-contamination from, from um, production processes. Things like cleaning down the belts between a, a chocolate that's dairy-based and a chocolate that isn't, and there would be some cross-contamination there. That's mm. all the case. Many of the foods that we eat as vegans that are labeled uh, may contain milk and that the vegan society would register potentially that, that that may contain warning is there, it's an allergen labelling, and it's there, of course, because to, to make clear that there is a possibility of cross-contamination. And what we're talking about there is a microscopic amount. Um, mm. It's not an intentional ingredient. And it's not clear really from that report what they're talking about. We don't know what what how many parts per million did they find. That's what we yeah. need, to, we mm. don't know. Um, so I, I think I think the jury's out on, on that one really without more information. And it is strange that it's not in their report. They don't give you any real details. Um, but um, in terms of the legal definition, we are we have been involved in things like the plant-based ISO, which is looking at a definition of this expression plant-based. Mm. And I'm, mm. I'm not on that committee, but my colleague who is um is Chantelle Adkins in our in our um in mm. our trademark team. She tells me that 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 is quite a difficult conversation because um, there are so many different interests and you tend to end up going for the lowest common denominator that everybody can live with. And that probably 
the worry with veganism would be that that wouldn't be our definition of veganism. So whilst we would support a legal definition of veganism, we'd want it to at least meet our current definition of veganism, which is something which is no animal products at all, including um, uh, byproducts or including things like honey. And I would be concerned that a legal definition might go in some other direction because lots of parties would be involved in that. They wouldn't just be taking our definition and going, well, this is the vegan society's definition, so that must be it. In reality, that's what currently happens because trading standards, if they're faced with a dispute, will take the vegan society's definition of vegan in the same way that they take the vegetarian society's definition of vegetarian. So almost by default, we somewhat have that today. If we all sit round a table with other stakeholders, we might end up with a watering down of that such that some inclusion or a, or a high parts per million is acceptable or honey is acceptable. Yeah. And that, that would be our slight concern about that. But in theory, yes, we, we would sign up to that as, as being a good thing. OK, thank you. I mean, just to add a footnote to that, uh, according to Ethical Consumer magazine, uh, in an issue from I think last September, they suggested or they stated that plant-based is is literally means that it's based on plant foods, but it's not exclusively plant foods. And according to them, uh, something that is quotes plant-based unquote can be up to five percent uh, dairy and or egg products. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that might be, you know, warning to others, you know, don't take plant based as being, uh, ex you know, exclusively vegan. Um, if I can get another question in, um, you mentioned about your 14 community organisers and 306 community advocates, uh, which is great. But who are they and what do they do? I mean, I don't, you know, it's uh, I mentioned that because I think a lot of members would like to be able to contact their local community organizer or advocate to offer help and support and also i'm thinking with uh uh in, in a latest issue of the vegan you have a, a, an events page and 10 events are listed there they're all sort of local vegan fairs and things which is great uh but uh i can't imagine the vegan society is going to send us run a stall at all of them all over the country and sometimes on the same day but wouldn't that be uh opportunities for you know v local vegan organizer or contact to book a stall at these events so that um you know people who you know they attract a lot of people uh are aware of the vegan society and uh uh just give one example in the newbury vegan market which i've been to several several times um it's only about a dozen stalls but almost without fail the wildlife trusts and or the woodland trust will have an information stall there purely for publicity purposes um so uh you know, and I can't imagine they won't send out the headquarters staff to those. Uh, it's presumably someone who's a local rep for them or a local Thanks, Paul. volunteer. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Sam? Mm. Uh, yeah, um, our advocates, um, our community network are, tend to be involved more in campaigning and um, also um, political um, relations work. So often we will ask them to contact their local MP or go along to their local MP surgery or make an appointment to have a conversation with them about particular aims that we're trying to, to make. So we've got representatives on the ground there. Obviously, as an MP, you, you have to listen to your constituents who might vote for you more than you would to the Vegan Society sending you a letter. Um, they'll reply to us, but we're really not as powerful at a local level as, as their own constituents, particularly if they turn up as a group. Um, they're also involved in, in campaigning at a local level for us. So it might be that, um, you know, they're, they're taking that message out to um, their own communities, either through, um, through leaflets or through petitions or other, um, other meetings. Um, what you're talking about, I think, is, is more of a specific team that would go and support us at, um, at, a, at local events that other people are organising. And that is something we are discussing at the moment with our volunteer coordinator, um, actually creating a team of people who would be able to take on that sort of work. 
because I think really you have to have signed up to do that. Um, I, I, our current community network have signed up for for a different sort of work, voluntary work, um, and they have you know the skills and interest to do that. But I think there are people who would be very keen to go and talk to the public and run an information store. Um, and we probably need to recruit for that really as a volunteer role. But yeah, and 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 probably give them the um, opportunity to scout out what would be the best places for us to go, which would be the best events for us to attend and to, to have that, to be empowered to do that really. But that, that's what we're looking to do to create those sorts of roles. Sorry, Stephen, I think you might have a point. Do you want to come yeah, in? So I was just going to add that um, for, a, for a staff point of view, we have just concentrated on um, the larger events such as uh, campaign, Veg Fair, Speaking Life Live, etc. But we are starting to um, dip our toes into more local events um, that work that are local to staff here. So we recently did um, a local vegan festival at Fargo in Coventry, and we're going to be doing a local uh, Birmingham one as well, just to sort of see how effective those are for us. And then maybe sort of we can you know use that experience to plan into uh, some of the things that Sam was talking about. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions on the chat before I go on to Shabali's question. Uh, one is a vegan medicine. They say uh, they want vegan vitamin D, but apparently it's not available on the NHS. Is that is that right? Uh, do you know if, that, if that's the case, Sam? It's it's usually a case of um, talking to your primary care team. Really, um, obviously, um, vegans do have a do have a protected characteristic so i think you know we hold a strongly held ethical belief it's not simply a, a taste preference or a, a you know a choice so having that conversation with your primary care team and explaining that this is an important issue for you if there is an alternative available they should try their best to supply it to you um often sometimes talking to a pharmacist can help as well um, they might be able to find you a source and then you can go back or work with them to go back to the practitioner and ask for it to be prescribed to you. Um, obviously, vegan vitamin D does exist. So commercially, you can go and buy it. And the vitamin D that's in Veg One, for example, is, is um, obviously vegan standard. Um, and is, you know, it's, it's easy enough to, to buy. But in terms of prescription, I can't say I know for sure on that one. But I would say it's probably worth having that conversation with your primary care team. If you do experience difficulties, then please do contact us and we'll we'll see if there's anything that we can do to, to, to help on that. Thank you. And, and uh, Rebecca's asked a question. I'm just going to sort of paraphrase. But if you see a product that says vegan, obviously not not with a vegan society logo, but something that says vegan, but then you see it contains honey, what action should we be taking? Um, that's that is a trading standards issue, we would say, because it's not um, it's not vegan to our definition of veganism, which excludes honey. Um, if you go to the um, uh, to the um, citizen advice um, website, they there is a they they have the contract for trading standards, so they have a they have a form that you can fill in there to report that um, item as as not being. Um, it, it, under trading standards as not being as it claims it's not a, it's not vegan um, and then trading standards will pick that up with the company yeah, yeah. but my understanding is that they they would pursue those things because they yeah, would right. take a definition probably first thing is probably contact the company to let them know in case they were just doing it by mistake or uh, i've seen sometimes they may have added it in and then taking the honey out without changing the labeling that's one possibility as well yeah, I think if it's a small company, it may be a genuine, genuine error. Yeah, I mean, if it was a, a large international company, yeah. I'd be surprised if that was accidental. Uh, Shabari, do you want to unmute? Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Sam. That was a really good presentation. Um, my question is, is that um, there's been um, some negativity um, about veganism in the press. Um, you know, for example, they were talking about um, there being less demand for um, vegan products. Um, I'm going to be participating um, uh, during a pitch day um, in a few months time um, for World Vegan Market and I, I want to talk about the um, the growing um, demand um, for vegan products not just in the UK but worldwide as well. Um, do you have any information um, on your website which I can include um, during my pitch and also if I get asked questions like for example um, the things that have been in the press recently about them you know I'm I'm not going to name uh, there, there's a particular um, sausage company um, that has now um, reduced their vegan options from eight to, to just two. Um, 
and uh, you know uh, that that has been in the papers and that has been uh, you know talked about um, a lot um, you know giving that example of vegan products um, being down um, in in demand. Um, yeah, on our um, on the media section of our website, um, we have a sheet on statistics, um, and that, that tends to be subdivided into various areas. So some of it is on looking at the sort of business landscape or the demand for vegan food. Um, so there are quite a few statistics on there that might be useful, and it, we usually link back to our source for that. So it will help you to find the original source if you need it from that link. Um, but again, if you're having any difficulties, um, you can always contact media at vegansociety.com and we'll happily um, see, see if we can find you anything else. Um, we have also produced some reports ourselves, which again are on our website. So things like um, um, there have been a number of, of different um, surveys and reports that we've done that might be of, of use. Um, I think um, the we, we've commented quite a lot publicly on on those these issues about peak veganism I suppose is what we tend to refer to it in-house so this idea that somehow veganism has has um, reached its its peak and and now is the demand is falling um our view on that is if we're looking at our own because we we do so much work commercially with the trademark we can see that we have um, clients that are still bringing on new products so it, they have a license that allows them to add additional products to their to their license um, which they have to bring to us for for registration and we can see that there are companies that are still expanding and expanding greatly that are still increasing their income fine there are other companies that that are as you say struggling and they're reducing their lines and brands and a lot of this is just about a market that was saturated really we saw huge increase like um, several hundred percent increase in 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 one year in in some of these product categories um, particularly things like um, meat substitutes and um, dairy alternatives. Um, so the market is inevitably going to kind of settle, really. And we know as vegans that some of the products that are out there aren't as good as others. And, and we make we've got limited. Everyone is struggling with the financial crisis. So we make decisions about how we're going to spend money in our shopping. And we're all looking to save money and cut down and look at different brands. Inevitably, some brands are going to fall foul of that. And some companies have struggled probably because they weren't meeting market demand. And I think there will, our feeling is there'll be a period of, re, of adjustment and then there'll be more innovation and things will start to grow again. But looking at, you know, what's happening overall, um, you know, our, our income from trademark is, is doing fine. We're ahead of targets. So that it's not as though there aren't a queue of people waiting with new products to be registered. There still are. Um, it, it, we're not, we're not struggling or scouting around for clients. It's not like that. So I, I think, you know, it's very difficult because you don't want to say these companies didn't have such good products and they're not doing as well. But in some cases, I think that's, you know, it is just about the market stabilizing and consumers choosing one brand over another. It, it, that's that really is how capitalism works. Some things fall by the wayside and other things thrive. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you very much, Sam. Are you, Sam, are you, are you free to take another couple of questions? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Happy to do uh, that. Yeah, John, don't unmute again, please. Right. Yeah. Um, yes, I think um, the word vegan to some people is seen as an extreme, even though in a good and positive way, and might be off putting for them to join the vegan society. But if it was if it was also branded as vegan and partially vegan, you might attract more people. Because I know that, in fact, to be a member of the vegan society, you can be the full member, full dietary vegan or an associate member. And you're still a member of the vegan society. But not people would know that. So if it was slightly rebranded, a lot of people who aren't vegan and feel a bit intimidated almost by it would think, oh, if it's also for people who are partially vegan who want to go in that direction, you might get a lot more people to uh, join. This is just what I put forward to you that might be a good idea. Okay. I, I think that's a, an interesting and fair point. Um, we, we do try in our communications to make clear that you don't have to be um, a dietary vegan or, or uh, you know, a life, a whole of lifestyle vegan in order to to be a full member, uh, to be a member, um, to be a full member, to have voting rights. You absolutely have to be able to tick the box to say that you're at least dietary vegan, but um, you don't you, you, you can be a member and have all the same benefits. You still receive the magazine and discounts and so on um, without having to, to follow a, a diet of a, a vegan diet. 
Um, but I do think that message does get lost in the wayside. Also, tragically, we find that there are people who are our members because they are vegan, who cease to be vegan for whatever reason, and they will sometimes write to us and say they no longer want to be a member because they're no longer vegan. And we always write back to them and say, no, that's absolutely fine. We're more than happy for you to stay a member because obviously if you're still getting our communications, you're much more likely to find your way back to veganism. Yeah. So we're keen that they remain members. But I'm sorry to say that often they still feel that it's not a place for them. Um, so it, it is when we look at the number of people um, who aren't vegan, who are members, it's quite small. There's a, there's a substantial number, but it's, it's not um, it's not huge. And sadly, people who cease to be vegan will leave us. So there is presumably something about us that isn't terribly welcoming. They feel to non-vegans. They don't feel like it's a place for them. And I think that that is that is a real problem for us because we want people who aren't vegans to join actively, because how else are they going to become vegan without having that support? You know, everybody needs to feel that there's a community that they belong to. Yeah, John, to add to that, Stephen. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, at the moment we, um, for our gift memberships, where somebody can buy a, a gift membership for somebody else, we offer a Go Vegan option. Uh, and that comes with a members pack with advice tailored to helping somebody go vegan and on our long list um, for stuff to do with membership and improve our membership is to offer like a go vegan option um, sort of for everybody uh, and that would come with advice again tailored to helping people go and stay vegan um, and transition from a from a meat or animal product diet. Thank you. Uh, last question Mahesh. Um, yeah, hi, it's Ty Brown again. Um, just a few reflections on what's been discussed so far. Um, when you're talking about legal definitions, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I think the only country at the moment that has a legal definition of vegan is India. Um, I think that's the case, but correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, and we, we've had some um, interesting experience because my recently my mother was admitted to hospital, so we got to know a bit about the hospital food. Um, and here in northwest london so this was northwick park hospital the the food was actually there was a surprisingly a lot of good vegan options on the menu there so uh they, they had brilliant sort of diverse menu of cultural um foods and a lot of so a lot of asian indian section had, had a lot of vegan food there but also in the other sections as well um there, there's something called there's vegan shepherd's pie available which is actually very good vegan schnitzel um, vegan fish fingers, so all sorts of really interesting things. It's quite gourmet. <laughs> um, so it's better than the hospital can public canteen food. The patient food was really good. Um, we've also noticed vegan, you have the vegan logo on on some medicines as well. So that's interesting. Um, that's an interesting development. So some of the medications are coming through. Um, and 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 the, the point about um, volunteer um, sending teams to to events. In the past, there was this group which a lot of people will know here called vegan campaigns and they used to do I think they used to do that basically they're a team of people who used to go out and run info schools and I think the vegan society provided them with a lot of material to go out and do that so I guess we need something like a team like that again um what I wanted to ask you was about um the vegan labeling um so so I mentioned we're, we're also trademark holders so so we we think that the, the vegan society trademark logo on, on products is brilliant and it's really good to see that um, it's it's there on some really big brands now. Um, Branston Pickle, I think, has got a Vegan Society trademark logo on it. Unfortunately, Hellman's has got, well, not unfortunately necessarily, but Hellman's has got the V-label um, trademark on there. And I know that I think the biggest trademark labels are kind of the maybe the Vegetarian Society's Vegan Label, V-label and the Vegan Societies. And to me, um, they're all very high standard actually um and i believe um this, I, this is what i want to ask you about um maybe you can talk about but my my impression is that 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 the vegan society label is when, when you compare it to to to, to supermarket own brand labeling where they just write their own vegan insignia or whatever um you know the, the standards probably vary in some way and and, and the vegan society is very strict as I, I believe, and I, I've looked into this, I think V label are also very strict, and I, I imagine the vegetarian society's vegan label is. Um, uh, maybe you could just el elaborate on that um, about the, the various labels, because um, is there a way that we can we can harmonise at all? Because it sounds a bit confusing as well, maybe. 
Um, yeah, I mean, every label has its um, own criteria and own standards, and you really have to go and dig into that to, to find out what they are often. Um, and, and that's true, not just in not just in the vegan sector, but um, I don't know, Red Tractor or um, Freedom Foods, or you, you have to really go and look at the standards to find out what standard those companies are being held to. So there are differences um, amongst trademarks. Um, interesting for example that the leaping bunny that i think we would all accept is a, is a high standard in terms of animal testing and cosmetics um their definition of animal isn't the vegan societies so they might allow testing on daphne for example whereas we wouldn't um and similarly their um their criteria for looking at animal testing goes back further down the train chain than ours does so we our standard would say that we have to know that um that, that there's there's been no animal testing by the company who produces the product or any a company over whom they have effective control. So if they're able to control that supply, then, then they must know that there's no animal testing. But when you go further back down the chain, they might not know whether that's taken place. And um, my understanding is that Leaping Bunny would look further back down that chain. So even amongst standards, there are, you could say, pros and cons. Think Things do do vary slightly. Um, I think the basic criteria amongst the, the, the main labels that you're talking about, the Vegan Society um, and um, uh, the V label and the uh, Vegetarian Society's vegan standard, they're, they're probably very similar, but there there will be, I suspect, suspect slight differences and they will, they will probably come into areas like um, certain tests that are used or um, processing, um, process, whether they look into processing channels, different sorts of processing ingredients that are used or um, often, um, yeah, they, they, they tend to be sort of slight differences in, in, in things like parts per million, that kind of thing. Th those, those will be part of their standards. And often it's not that public to get to that information either. You often need to, to be a client to know actually what the differences in those standards are. Um, but, but broadly speaking, I think the, the main symbols will be quite similar. There is actually a huge proliferation of these symbols as well. Um, we used to have a, um, a presentation which looked at all the different symbols. And to my knowledge, there were about 30, I think, um, even then. And this is going back about six years ago. So across the world, there are a number of vegan um, different sort of um, trademarks. Um, and, they're, and they're increasing all the time because there is no barrier to entry. Anyone here could set up an organization tomorrow that would offer to, to register products uh, as vegan. Um, some, of, some of those symbols won't involve a great deal of, of checking. So we would always um, be checking with that manufacturer back through that chain to make sure that everything meets our standards, not just the ingredients, but the processing aids that are used. Um, there's quite a lot of work that, that goes into it. And I think our standard is certainly you know, one of the highest, but um, some some really? systems simply what's known as um, self um, declaration. So there are some schemes where you can simply fill out a form to say, I've read and understood the standards and my product conforms to that. And they'll send you a certificate back by return and their logo and you can get on with it. Um, and it's very difficult for a consumer to know where self certification has happened and where there's, there's a really high standard. Um, and I think that's, there's in some ways no regulation of that. One of the things you know we are looking at is potentially looking at accreditation, independent accreditation of our work, so that somebody would be checking that our standards are being kept to as well, so so that we have that external oversight. Yeah, I mean it's important for for the public to know that that your standards and I have to say I think those of V Label and the, the Vegan Vegetarian Society vegans that they are the highest you know the highest out there. Um, but, but yeah, that's 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 not really well known, you know, compared to compared to the other many standards that you mentioned. So so that's mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's just something that I think because often I think people will trust a vegan supermarket label's own vegan um, labeling to 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 be well. It says vegan, so it must be vegan, but it's not as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I think broadly speaking, if it wasn't meeting a, a basic standard of veganism, then people, you know, if for example there's honey written on that label, as someone was saying, then you could of course take that to trading standards. So I would I would think that if a supermarket got that wrong, that would be accidental and they would want to have that pointed out to them, they'd want to put it right. Um but there are there are there's a there's an awful lot behind the um 
it, it, but behind the scenes that could be happening that might make something not vegan, including tests that are done on products um, that might use animal materials, for example. Um, and it's those are the kind of things that we do look into. But I don't know that every standard and certainly self-declaration wouldn't. OK, thank you for the question. Um, I'll draw the questions to a close at that point. I'd like to um, thank you for asking your questions. I thank particularly uh, Sam, Stephen and Gemma for coming and spending some time with us this evening uh, from the Vegan Society. If I could ask you all, if you just have a round of applause for our speakers, I appreciate that. Thank you.